All right, Joel, we have for you Mr. Morris, a 64-year-old gentleman with a history of high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and chronic kidney disease. He is currently on losartan, amlodipine, hydrochlorothiazide, metformin, and atorvastatin. Mr. Morris's hemoglobin A1c is 7.6 and his EGFR is 30. Urine albumin creatinine ratio is 120. The blood pressure in the office is 139 over 85. Mr. Morris has recently moved cities. He's establishing care with you as his primary care physician at Cashlack. And so this is the patient for whom we would obviously think about an SGLT2 inhibitor. And I, I'd like to hear from you, Joel, uh, as we start, what kind of calculus goes into your decision to start an SGLT2? Yeah. So Mr. Morris is kind of a, a prototypical patient for an SGLT2 inhibitor. Kind of when I see these patients on their first visit, one of the things that I make the centerpiece of my discussion is I do a uh, renal failure uh, risk equation. And I've talked about this on the, or excuse me, the kidney failure risk equation. I've talked about this on the curbsiders before. And essentially this takes the GFR, the age and gender of the patient, whether they're North American or not, and then tells you what their likelihood of needing dialysis. And so, um, and so when I did this for Mr. Uh, uh, Moore, is that his name? Mr. Morris, Mr. M Mr. Morris, um, his albumin creatinine ratio is 120. He comes out with a um, a two-year risk of dialysis of 5% and a five-year risk of dialysis of 15%. And this is the kind of thing I think, it, and this to me is so much more helpful than saying this guy is CKD stage 3B or saying he's orange on the KD go heat map. And people are like, I, I don't know, orange doesn't seem good, but what do I do with that? Yeah. And when you tell them you know, here, here we're looking at a 15%, kind of a one in six chance of you being on dialysis in the next five years, their eyes kind of pop and they're like, oh, okay, that's a, that, that makes it real for people. And they can kind of start to, you know, and I, and that makes it real for me too. It helps me kind of, you know, think about, okay, what are we doing and how can we help this guy? And, you know, unfortunately there's not usually a lot we can do for the serum creatinine. And I really kind of focus in on, that albuminuria is kind of the modifiable risk factor. What kind of things can we do? And, you know, table stakes. The first thing that you're going to do, especially for patients with diabetes, is going to use RAS inhibition. So you're going to you start them up on an angiotensin receptor blocker or an ACE inhibitor. And he's already on, which he on, lisinopril or losartan. So you're going to, he's, a, he's on losartan. Um, so you'd want to make sure that's maximized. Right. So for Los Harden, that's a like hundred milligrams. I like, um, I listened to the curbsiders and they had this great episode with Jordy Cohn. And she said she didn't like Los Harden. She likes, uh, Talmus Harden. And so I do whatever Jordy tells me. And so I, <laughs> if his blood pressure actually looks, doesn't look terrible, it's not quite at goal. 139 over 85 is a little rich. I'd want to work that down. And, and one of the things I would do about that would be switching him. Uh, from losartan to telmosartan and, and switch him from hydrochlorothiazide to chlorthalidone, which is a more effective thiazide-like diuretic. Okay, because we're really looking for blood pressures in the 120s here. And the reason the reason she doesn't like losartan as much is because it's a shorter acting medication. So should be dosed twice a day, but like olmosartan, telmosartan, candesartan, those ones are longer acting. She said valsartan is a also little bit short. of a weaker agent. Yep. But yeah. Yeah. But Valsartan's a little weaker. That's another reason she doesn't use that one. So, yeah, I mean, uh, this, this, so this, this patient is at risk. So you're saying, like, I think we talked to uh, when we were talking to Tapper about liver. He said, like, the bilirubin is like that's where he he looks at that bilirubin. That's how anxious he gets about somebody's liver disease. So it sounds like you're saying this proteinuria, albuminuria, that that kind of raises your level of worry about a patient. Absolutely. Right. And again, it's the modifiable one. So the one that you're going to be able to make an, a, a change with by changing the medications and, and, get, and getting his blood pressure down and getting his um, and getting and, and changing agents. And so the next question was the SGLT2 inhibitor. And so that's a that's a great that's a great option for these guys that we have. We've got study after study. And he's kind of the prototypical patient that's been enrolled um, His GFR is 30 and, and pretty much. Um, every single one of the uh, studies that looked at that, at that enrolled patients with chronic kidney disease enrolled people down to a GFR of 30. Now, a few of them have gone below that, right? So, you know, this is a question I get is how low can you go when you start uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor? And so kind of the first wave of these studies, uh, EMPA-REG, which is the uh, empagliflozin outcome study, uh, CANVAS, uh, which was the um, canagliflozin outcome study, and Credence, which was the very first um, CKD-specific study, 
and roll people down to a GFR of 30. DAPA CKD, which was dipagliflozin, looking for chronic kidney disease outcomes, they roll people down to 25. And then just this past fall, we pub, uh, EMPA kidney was published and enrolled patients down to a GFR of 20. And so you know, that's kind of like the, the lowest that we've gone up to now. Um, but the, all those studies have been positive, right? No, none of them showed any decreased effectiveness at low GFR. And so we're comfortable enrolling patients, uh, starting patients on SGLT2 inhibitors down to a GFR of 20. Now, one of the things that I'm a little worried about with this guy is uh, a GFR of 30 in metformin is kind of on the edge for me. I'm okay with that, but I know I'm going to drop his GFR a little bit further when I start the um, SGLT2 inhibitor. And I think I'd want to probably get him off that metformin if we were going to go there. And so this is something I'd probably, right? So this is something I'd probably want to coordinate with his primary care doctor, say, hey, I think he really does need uh, the SGLT2 inhibitor. I don't know, his GFR very well could fall down to 26, which would be, you know, a 10% drop. And that wouldn't, that wouldn't bother me at all, but that would make me a little uncomfortable rolling, rolling with that metformin still. Right. And so that would, that would be something that where I'd want to coordinate with this PCP and say, hey, can we switch him off this? Is there something else that we could use? Yeah, so Paul, because this uh, this is good good information, new information for me, because I I always thought that you know once people are enter that CKD four territory, that probably we shouldn't be using those. I don't know what you've been doing, but this has been a a point of concern for me. That was the point I wanted to, to clarify or at least emphasize. It sounds like we historically have been wary of those numbers because it had not been studied, not because there's some sort of catastrophic outcome that had occurred with them, and now we've actually had trials that have started a little bit lower, and it seems like we're we're feeling more and more comfortable with that. So we've not. The evidence is not there to support us just be, just because it had been studied was more the unease, if I'm understanding things correctly. Is that fair to say, Joel? Yeah. I, I mean, all the cases of metformin-associated lactic acidosis I have seen have been patients that developed acute kidney injury. It's never been the slowly progressive stable CKD when they finally crossed some imaginary GFR line that got into trouble with metformin-associated lactic acidosis. 